All right, everyone. Good morning. I know there's some people still grabbing some goodies, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to Creative Mornings. Uh, kind of give a rundown of what we're doing here uh, before we introduce our speaker and get going. So um, this is Creative Mornings. Uh, we meet once a month, every third Friday, every month, uh, in very pl various places uh, around town. And we're but we're part of a global organization. So Creative Mornings was started in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and it's basically grown from city and city to there. So we applied to be a chapter back in 2020. Uh, perfect time for, uh, you know, in-person events. Uh, but we, we made it through, and, uh, and, and here we are now at uh, the beautiful Mamie Gallery. One cool thing about Creative Mornings is um, Every month there's a theme, and uh, one of those chapters that apply to become a chapter gets to choose that theme. This month's theme uh, is ritual. It was chosen by the Charlottesville chapter. There was some confusion about whether it was Charlottesville or Charlotte. It is the Charlottesville chapter uh, in Virginia. And then this illustration was done by uh, a Charlottesville artist named Matt Smithson. So part of uh, part of the monthly theme is a bit of a blur that helps us kind of like get in the zone a little bit, thinking about rituals. So uh, again, this was chosen by the Charlottesville chapter. Uh, ritual add rituals add meaning and a deeper sense of connection to our lives. They allow us to practice mindfulness and reflection. Unlike our daily routine and habits, rituals have the power to inspire us. Brushing your teeth is a ritual. Going for a morning walk would be a good habit. And writing a gratitude journal could become your morning ritual. The key is to act with intentionality. Our creative morning events have their own rituals. Getting a cup of coffee creates an opportunity to say hello to someone while you wait your turn in line. Reading our manifesto out loud reinforces our beliefs that everyone is creative and everyone is welcome. What rituals do you practice in your relationships, your spirituality, and your creative work? How do they heighten your sense of purpose and belonging in this world? So you're going to hear this word a lot, ritual, today. Um, and part of Creative Mornings is doing a little icebreaker. These are always fun. Uh, so uh, we're going to go around. First person to raise their hand uh, can, can share. But yeah, what's your go-to creative ritual that sparks imagination or just gets you in the zone or just like Takes you from, uh, I, you know, for a lot of us, it's a cup of coffee. I start by with a cup of coffee in their hand. That's probably a ritual. But yeah, just this kind of gets you going, right? Um, whether that be a creative endeavor or or otherwise. But yeah, what do we? What 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 helps? What helps get y'all in the in the spirit? Music. Music. Thank you. Particular music? Does it depend? Depends. Yeah. What what would be the music today? Would you say? <sighs> Today I have to clean and focus, so it would probably be something that I can sing along to, probably from the 90s. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I know the right. exact vibe. I know exactly what you're going for. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 90s cleaning? Yeah. 90s cleaning? Of course. Yeah. Of course. Everybody likes to sing when they clean, right? That helps you get through. It's going to be like tough on things, right? Yeah. Studio cleanup day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, other rituals. Who else has rituals? Yeah. I go for walks. Yeah. That, that's that's my big thing. It helps me clear my head. And I always I always end up like at some point I'm like, oh, that's that's what I need to do. It helps me helps me get my get my thoughts straight. So walking is big. Making a good cup of coffee. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Something complicated. Yeah. Like, oh, a, like a French press. Oh, Something I have okay. A oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, you're getting, getting the hands going. Got focus. Yeah. My thing when I have a, um, a creative block <coughs> is I, I use a lot of different herbs and I'll make a smoke bowl. I clear my space and my energy. Yeah. I put the smoke bowl on at night and then I usually have. 
have dreams of what I'm going to create next. What? Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. I think that, I think that, no offense to everybody else, has Kind of the coolest that, that wins. Yeah, that wins. <laughs> it's not a contest. Oh, yeah. It's never been a contest. But wow. But she won. <laughs> yeah. That's very neat. That's very neat. Okay, awesome, y'all. Well, well, thank you for sharing. Does anybody have any other before we, before we get going? I don't okay. know if this is so much a ritual, but I, I gain a lot of inspiration from talking to people that are creative and seeing what they're doing. It gets me all fired up. And sure. Things, thinking about what I'm doing. Yeah. Well, you came to the right place. That's, that's partially what, what, what we're here for. Yeah, Sarah. So I make jewelry, and I have in my areas, I have a ritual that I do right before I sit down at my bench, and it's music. I'm surrounded by my plants. I light a candle, and I burn some sage. And then I sit, and I take a breath, and let the jewelry come to me as I create. Yes. It's one of my favorite times, you know? Because usually when I get into my workspace, nobody is bothering me because they know that that's what I'm doing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Door is closed, it's my space, my time. And yeah. I love it. Yeah, it's like family members, they smell the sage, you know, like, all right, hey, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> she's working. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I might even look into these herbs and the, and the sage and stuff. This is, yeah, this is I like to clear the energy sure. before I get started. Yeah. Well, the two is mugwort and damiana. Mugwort and damiana. Yeah, don't drink it. Just put it in a bowl and it's okay. really, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're recording this, so <laughs> I'm going to remember this from the recording. Yeah. Mugwort. What was your name? Damiana. Damiana. Yeah. Okay. And if you really want to get creative, a little bit of blue lotus about what oh. Oh. <laughs> Now for beginners. <laughs> 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 you gotta build up to <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, hey, that, that, was, that was really good. I feel like the, I feel like the ice is broken, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, so like I said, great mornings. It's a global organization. There's actually 238 uh, chapters. And quite a few are meeting today. So you can see here, um, I never think to actually like see what these abbreviations are. Uh, <laughs> other places. Yeah, yeah, there's other places that are, that, are, that are doing the same exact thing we're doing today. Uh, in fact, here we are right here, yay! yay. There's Detroit, I know that one. Dallas, Houston, Houston. Milwaukee, yep. probably. Uh, Tucson, yeah. Um, yeah, they do the, they, they, see, they split up, they do the live stream as well. Um, so yeah, it, this is, uh, so yeah, you guys are part of something um, much bigger than just what's, what's going on in this room. Speaking of what's going on in this room, we are at the Mop Mini Gallery. Woo! Super exciting. This is actually supposed to be our venue. So our first event was in January of 2020. Again, great <laughs> Our second event, February 2020 was supposed to be here. We actually did a sound check and everything, and then we canceled, of course. Like two days before, we were like, ah, oh, we're gonna let this thing blow over, and you know, we'll be back in a few months. And we all we all know what happened from there. But so happy we were able to um, get back to the Mount Mini Gallery. This place is so awesome. The the history museum over there, if you if you don't get a chance, if you have some time on your way out, definitely check that out if you haven't already. Uh, but beautiful space. Uh, so we thank the the Mount Mini Gallery. Also, um, I want to give a shout out to Danny's Landscaping. Woo, woo, woo. Yeah, they are the suppliers of donuts and the coffee today. Um, <clears throat> you've probably seen their, I know I have at least, their, their, their trucks around town um, specializing in landscaping, hardscaping, all that good stuff. Definitely check out the website. They have awesome pictures on there if you have any yeah. um, upcoming projects or, or just want to get a bid, um, definitely reach out. Super supportive of the, the creative community. Get quicker than, oh, there we go. Uh, speaking of sponsors, um, if you're interested in sponsoring or you know someone who might be, uh, please shoot us an email at Columbia at creativemornings.com. We're always looking for um, sponsors. This is a volunteer organization. Uh, so any 
monetary or venue support uh, is, is greatly appreciated. Uh, before we jump into the manifesto, which I mentioned earlier, um, the biggest way we grow our chapter is by bringing friends. It's very easy to make friends here. Someone mentioned earlier, you know, they they get creative juices from talking to other creatives. This is the perfect space for that. And uh, we're looking to do more things that aren't just, you know, morning events. Um, but we can't grow our chapter unless folks bring other folks. So uh, if you make a friend, it's kind of like take a penny, leave a penny. If you make a friend today, or if you made a friend at Creative Morning, bring a friend next time. All right, so uh, before we pass it over to the speaker, um, every event we read the manifesto, which similar to the monthly theme, it kind of gets us gets us in the right headspace, um, kind of gets us to the vibe of of Creative Morning itself. I'm going to read the manifesto today. Everyone is creative. <laughs> so I used to uh, I used to read this like very <laughs> elaborately. Like, I'm not doing that. Know. That just came naturally. I didn't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we were all open. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone is creative. A creative life requires bravery and action, honesty, and hard work. We're here to support you, celebrate you, and encourage you to make the things you love. We believe in the power of community. We believe in giving a damn! We believe in face-to-face -face connections and learning from others in hugs and high fives. We bring together people who are driven by passion and purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in neighborhoods and cities around the world. Everyone is welcome. Oh. All right. Good job, Time for the big event. Uh, what everyone's actually here for. <laughs> to hear from Nancy Link Elliott, who has been an active member of the Columbia Weavers and Spinners Guild since 2010. Over the years, she has served as a study group coordinator, vice president, and president. Currently, she volunteers as the marketing coordinator for the Guild's holiday exhibition and sale. Now retired, Nancy dedicates much of her creative energy to fiber arts and bookmarking, bookmaking, sorry, uh, selling her creations at the Guild Sale and Blue Step. She studied art and biology in college and has had a diverse career encompassing lab work, teaching, nonprofit management, and administrative support. Originally from the outskirts of Chicago, Nancy has lived across the US and spent a year in Tanzania. In 2008, she moved from San Antonio, Texas to Columbia, Missouri, where she enjoys her peaceful home surrounded by woods and a small prairie. Let's welcome Nancy. Thread of the weaving goes through the reed 
and the reed helps then pack those uh, threads together in a process called beading. And you'll see in front of that uh, these shuttles, which hold yarn also. You see the uh, open threads that are going the long way. And that's called warp. And there's a thread off here to the side, or a yarn off to the side, and that's coming out of one of the shuttles. <clears throat> and the shuttles are used to deliver threads back and forth across the warp, and those are called the web. And it's the interaction of those two things uh, that makes fabric, that binds them together and structurally, so it's you have fabric. All right, let's see what we got here. Oh, oh, let's do this. So I'm with the Columbia Weavers and Spinners Guild, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that after I talk a little bit about ritual. So we're gonna start with ritual. Seems more woven things up close. These are towels by Jenny Chikomi. And uh, again, if you look closely, even though it may be more complicated, it still involves threads going this way and this way. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start by um, having you all do some reflection. So I want you all to look at your clothes. And, uh, you know, we're so lucky these days when we want clothes, we just go buy them. And uh, you can do some tests on your clothes. So if you go like this and it's stretchy, that's knit. So Pam up here is knitting. And she's using two needles. And these are knit on a machine that is much more complicated than that. You can look them up, it's pretty fascinating to see. And of interest, I've recently learned that they have never been able to make a machine that reproduces crochet. Wow. So that's how, how complex taking one string or thread or yarn and looping it into itself can be. Okay, so we got knit. Knits are things that are stretchy, usually. And then if it isn't, it's probably woven. And that's what you were seeing up in the beginning, it was woven fabric. And if you have jeans on, oh, here we go, jeans on, and look down, you may notice that there's a surface that goes at a diagonal. And that's a very simple, simple uh, change in weed structure from that, that um, basic over, under, over, under, which was not what Cheryl was doing, <laughs> that was much more complex, to a little shift that causes those diagonals to form, and those are all called weave structures. And the curl, it makes the fabric stronger, which is why jeans are made out of it. And you're wearing that all the time. So, um, and I was gonna ask you to think of an example of how uh, creativity comes into your, your creative practices, but we've already gotten there. Um, let me see. Okay, I'm going to digress, and, and it's good that we've got a timer who's going to show it. Show me how many minutes. <laughs> That's a good time. So, a little history. Um, if you drove in on a Nifong or Providence, you probably might have noticed this. Maybe not. I look at plants all the time. You might not. You might have noticed this at the side of the road in abundance this year. It is really abundant. Uh, this is teasel, and it is native to Europe, the Mediterranean, North Africa, maybe Southeast Asia. Uh, it's now uh, a weed in, uh, worldwide and uh, is a noxious weed, declared a noxious weed in Missouri. But uh, this plant has a connection to uh, fabric making, and that is that these these are the flowers coming out, the ones that are white, and then as it matures and, and the seeds develop, you get this complex spiky head on it. And these uh, teasel heads were used for raising nap on woven woolen uh, fabric, and so they were actually uh, an important element. So raising nap means if you have fabric and you brush it, if it's wool and it has some little bit of fluffiness to the yarns, 
and you brush it with something stiff like diesel, it will pull just little bits of the yarn up, just little fibers, not the yarn itself, but fibers will come up, giving a soft or napped surface, and that's what these are used for. Whether or not weavers are to blame for bringing this to the United States, <laughs> I can't say. Um, and I can pass this around, but just be aware that it's a little spiky. It's, it's not, stickery. It's a little stickery, but you can, I got a dry one so you can feel what it, how, uh, well that one's not even dry, but it's, it's still hanging out. <coughs> okay, there's my little, my first mechanical digression. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and now we'll start in on ritual. So, as I sat and thought about ritual, um, and, and things to say about it, I was reminded of this passage. So when I was an undergraduate at the University of Iowa, I had a, a literature class, and one of the books we read was a small volume by Kafka called Parables and Paradoxes, and they're, they're wonderful. And this one in particular has stuck with me over the years, because I think in this few sentences, he, it may all be one sentence, one sentence. He describes a, an element of uh, much of our lives, daily and more organized, that um, happens over and over again. So while you're looking at it, I'll read it to you. Leopards break into the temple and drink to the dregs what is in the sacrificial pitchers. This is repeated over and over again. Finally, it can be calculated in advance and it becomes part of the ceremony. So once you've read this, if you keep it in the back of your mind, uh -huh. you'll find that this happens over and over again in, in things that we're experiencing and doing. Something that wasn't normally part of an ongoing place, practice, whatever. There's the old um, story that I think a lot of ministers used about the woman who always cut the end off the ham before she put it in the pot and uh, somebody or one of her kids asked her one day what why do you do that well my mother always do it did it well why did she do it well finally when her mother was there she said mom why did you always cut the end why do we always cut the end off the ham bone she said because it wouldn't fit in my pot <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and became a family tradition. <laughs> and, and well, so there's another word, so we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. It's like I said, I digress. So, uh, and the paradox here on this beautiful, beautiful leopard, which I did get to see when we lived in Tanzania, uh, but it has blue eyes, so I think that's the paradox on this one, because usually they have a kind of golden brown eye. But, do I pull I don't, it, uh, batteries must be. Okay, so here's just a simple definition from Merriam-Webster. Uh, and it's a ceremony, which is what was depicted in that beautiful artwork at the beginning as some kind of a ceremony, uh, an observance, a ceremonial action. And then I think for me, at least, that the, the the final uh, breakout, an act or series of acts regularly repeated in a set and precise manner, makes a lot of sense in the creative world. And uh, I think we probably all do that. But then as I thought more about, oh wait, I put this in for Tina, or any other word nerds in the room, uh, the <laughs> etymology. <laughs> Uh, started the word ritual was first noticed around the 1560s, and, and it comes from the French rituel. Is that close enough? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. French. Yeah. I did listen to it online quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Latin word ritualis, which referred specifically to religious uh, observances. But by 1630, it had, it had morphed into the use we this final use, I think, more and more, uh, where it is uh, not necessarily tied to a religious ceremony. And then, of course, there is the pejorative use of the word ritual, which is like, oh, you just do that because it's a ritual, uh, where it's seen as somebody doing a thing, a behavior, uh, with, without thought or meaning. 
So some things to ponder from that, um, aside from what are rituals in your life. Uh, the other thing I thought about is what's the difference between a habit and a ritual, and or maybe a tradition and a ritual. And what I think it comes down to is that when something becomes a ritual for us, we've imparted a sense of meaning to it. And I think we have a lot of rituals in our day-to-day -day lives that we're not aware of. So we are sitting there going, I'm always going to, and, and you know, because this is a ritual of mine, we just do them. But I think we have underlying reasons why we do a lot of these things. So I think if we're thinking about our own creative practices or our, our own daily lives, if you think, I always blank when I blank because, and, and that because kind of gets you to move into this, well, yeah, I do this because it helps me center and be calm before I do my creative practice, or it puts me in the right, you know, flow or whatever. Like when I'm making a book, I get, I get out the things that I want to use for the cover, I study the cover and the pages, and you know, and have those all assembled, coming together. And then it's like, oh, okay, this is how I'm gonna make this particular book, and, and I might pull something in. So it's not so much of a ritual as, as a, a practice, but I think we have a lot of these in our day-to-day -day lives. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, they can provide comfort in a way. Um, not necessarily, and, well, probably, even the most high form of ritual in, in, you know, that we may think of in um, religious or uh, uh, military certainly has a lot of ritual, government has ritual, I mean, and a lot of them are very complex and may involve um, a number of elements and items. But, and I think in our day-to-day -day lives, we make up these little rituals that I think sort of streamline how we do things because we don't have to think about it. And, and there's a certain amount of comfort in, um, in just being able to like launch without, you know, like, I'm gonna have to do this, I have to do this. No, you, you've made yourself a little meaningful launch pad to get into whatever it is you're gonna be doing next. <coughs> um, so let me, uh, so, oh, so of course, thinking about ritual and habit, and I went to the internet and Google uh, ritual and creativity, and was like, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> okay, there's a lot out there. So I picked out a couple. Um, here on the right, we have some complex weaving, more complex weaving. I think I, does anyone, anyone know if that's HF or four? These people want to see. <laughs> Anyhow, this is by Jan Berry, one of our uh, one of our members who um, had an incredible use not only of the structure of the fabric, so how the how the warp and the web interact with each other, but um, variations in color. So uh, uh, this artist had a couple points of view on um, a ritual. Many creative thinkers, athletes, and performers famously have creative rituals that help them perform complex tasks at a high level. But these simple practices can be helpful to anyone. Well, I think that gets at that idea that if you have a ritual, it moves you forward into a place you want to be, uh, maybe faster or more effectively. And then I especially like the bottom here, a ritual is a habit that prepares your mind for an activity. They can produce many different mindsets appropriate for many different kinds of activities. And I think that that's a really good summary. And this artist uh, started out thinking about how anthropologists might view ritual. If we wanted to bother anthropologists, rituals have sacredness to them. Rituals are manifestations of desires or fears, death, birth, war. Even in art, there are almost sacred rites that resemble death, birth, war, which are therefore not really bureaucracies dressed up as rituals. 
There are creative rights, those preceding the composition of a work, painting on canvas, writing a book, and there are organizational rights, when the work is born and is ready to enter the world. I love those last two distinctions because you know, probably today we're thinking more about rituals in our creative practices, but there, there's the next step where you want the thing that you created, or I think most people want the thing that they created, to be delivered out into the world. I mean, yes, we do it all for ourselves because we really like what we're doing, but at some point you want that to be delivered out into the world as is you know, we see witnessed by the art all around us. And, and certainly if you're dealing with galleries, there are a lot of logistical uh, rituals you have to go through. If at an opening, there's the ritual of interacting with the right people in the right way and so on and so forth. So I think that's an, another interesting uh, dimension that she's pointing out to uh, ritual and the creative practice. Um, let's see what I have next. Oh yeah, and I found this, and I just put, threw it in because, so this is from the Tate Modern uh, Art Museum in England, and this is a nice little uh, student uh, guide to ritual and art. And I love when you're trying to learn something new, student stuff is often, you know, the easiest way to get in because everything that you don't need has been stripped away, and you get that first introduction to, to whatever it is. So what is a ritual? Art items related to ritual. So if you're interested in following that a little bit, go to the Tate's website and, uh, and look for that. So, okay, let me stay there for a minute and just summarize. So uh, I think ritual and art, you know, it can be something that we do to prepare ourselves for making art or whatever our creative mode is. Uh, it can be part of the practice of making that thing. It can be something uh, that happens after the work is made to deliver it to the world. And then, of course, there are rituals that are the events, that are practices, that are more like the religious ceremony. There's a lot of, um, oops, just lost the word, art, or oh, performance art. Go ahead. Performance art now, and I think there's a lot of ritual involved with that, and it's it's a combination of behaviors and things, and so that when I was thinking about that, it, it took me right to our our own native son, Nick Cave, the artist, not Nick Cave, the singer. <laughs> if you Google it, you have to write in Nick Cave, the artist who grew up in Fulton, and he developed what he calls sound suits. And they are immense wearable sculptures with moving parts that, I think it said on his website, the first one he developed was after, it may have been as far back as when Rodney King was shot, but it was the unnecessary shooting of a young black man. And he was, you know, I mean, what do you do with that day after day? And he went out and started collecting all these sticks and things and made them into a suit. He was working through that uh, heinous act in, through his art. And it's this big structure that fits over the body. And he wanted that to uh, cover the body to eliminate any evidence of gender or race or whatever to completely cover the human form. And uh, when he actually tried it out, he realized it also made sound when it moved. And he's gone on to make many, many of these incredible sound suits that are, of course, on display in museums where you not only can't touch them, but you don't see them in action, but there are recordings of them being used in performance. And I think that's a great example of art that has, of course, meaning and viewed into it, but also a great deal of ritual around those and how they're used. Okay, so now I'm going to take a turn to um, <coughs> a very old pair of shoes indeed. Um, so 
of the Columbia Weavers and Spinners Guild, and I'm gonna tell you more about them, but uh, I think I like to ponder from time to time how, how we got here through history, long history. So um, at the beginning, I had all of your clothes, and we all think about how easy it is to get them nowadays. But of course, in human cultural evolution, those things came about slowly over tens of thousands of years, probably. And um, the first thing you had to have to make a cord or to tie something together is some fiber. And the two main sources of fiber are plants and animals. And uh, so I like starting with this image, which is of a pair of 8,000 year old shoes that were found in a cave in eastern Missouri. And um, many of the fiber things that early peoples did didn't survive because fibers rot. So they keep finding more and more. And this was found because the cave goes up inside and had a dry platform, and so many things had been preserved. So these shoes, or foot coverings, are made out of a plant called grass snake master that grows in prairies, and prairies used to cover most of the middle of the United States and much of Missouri, except in the Ozarks. And now it exists in little, little tidbits here and there. Um, so this plant would have been uh, uh, readily available, and I'm going to pass this around. There might be enough for everyone to have one, <laughs> or I can cut them in half if you want, because I want you to look at it. They're a little prickly, too. Look at it and think about how many leaves you'd have to collect, and that's the first step. So the first step is collecting the leaves. In other fibers, the first step is finding a plant whose fibers you can extract. But here we're just talking about leaves to make that pair of foot coverings and then figuring out how to do that. So I'll point out a couple things on this. One is you can see that there are structures going this way and structures going that way. So that's your basic weaving. Up here, we seem to have some that are twisted together, and that's a, a me method of cording, making cord. And then at, uh, uh, above the, well, kind of in the middle, I should have brought it. There's there. actually a, there's one on there. Yeah, oh, there it there's is. There's a little red line up there. Oh, yeah. Oh, right here, right here. <laughs> See how they go at an angle? I'm going to now back it up, I hope. That's the same technique that Darcy used here in making this rug. It's called twining, where you have two fibers that are twisted as they wrap around a third fiber going perpendicular. So this stuff's been around for a long time. And that's the one backwards. I invite you all to go to the Museum of Archaeology, Art and Archaeology and see these. They have them in, I, well, I haven't been there since they moved, but they have a special uh, environmental display case, and you can can go look at these in person. So I think I show that because it, it's a kind of a history of, of fiber in the human existence, which turns out to be darn important because we all like having our clothes on, but <laughs> it was necessary simply to tie things together, to make a fishing line, um, and to weave eventually weave into cloth or loop. Many forms of looping have evolved over centuries. Um, and then eventually, if you can do that enough, you end up with fabric, and then with fabric, you can make a living, a dwelling, uh, you can make clothing, you can make, and, and think of pottery. It's important that baskets could be used for water collection, storage, all of those things. So a big history of necessity. But along the way, and you see this in the ancient stuff too, 
decoration came in. And uh, I think that's what a lot of us are still doing, is taking the basic fiber, and it could be something as simple as that, and modifying it to make something that's more of a, of a decorative item, because we all love living with those things. Okay, so the gill. Oh, this is the plant. So uh, you're, you're handing out leaves that are from the base of the plant that come out down there. And then I, I always have to show, or I like to show the flowers, because to me they're some of the most beautifully sculptural flowers you can imagine. And, uh, and they're blooming right now, so if you go to any prairie, friendly prairie, south of Sedalia, friendly prairie south of Sedalia had a lot of this stuff. So if you wanted to have a little day hike, um, you could go there and look at it. So I think that, that for those of us that are in the Guild, and I want to thank all of those people from the Guild who are here and, and demonstrating their various skills, um, we have a love of materials. And um, I hope all of you who are not fiber people will take advantage of uh, some of the things on that back table where I brought a few kinds of fiber, that they, there's some handmade paper and some mold in um, anything that's out you can touch. And, and fiber doesn't break, so you can, <laughs> and, and you gotta touch it because that's, that's part of working with fiber. It's very tactile. So there's this, I think, kind of a two-part thing. There's, and it's really basic. There are the materials. Do we like materials? Yes, we don't like materials, sometimes too much, um, and the processes. So again, it's this idea of how one, one piece of string, yarn cord, can become something as complicated as the clothes we're wearing, or you know, two pieces going in opposite directions can create these remarkable patterns, even the um, covering of these chairs is a complex weave that's allowing for structure, three-dimensional structure in, in that weaving. And I think that's kind of, it's what drew me in. Anyone else want to add to that about what drew them to fiber arts? I mean, there's nothing better than buying a whole lot of wool. I don't spin, I only do a tiny bit of felting, I have a big drawer full of wool because I get my hand in there and I'm just like, oh, this is the best. And maybe that's all I need it for. But we have other people who are talented enough to take that wool and make it into yarn and then knit it into something. So anyhow, uh, so the guild, the, uh, oh, let me, let me picture here. Oh, there we go. Another complex week. Um, I will say though, in this one, if you look carefully, you can see mm -hmm. diagonals in there, and, and that's because a lot of these, or maybe all of them, uh, complex weaves are based off that basic twill. That's what makes the denim in your jeans. So um, now all the weavers are studying that to figure out exactly how that's happening. It's all, actually, it's pretty interesting because it's all mathematical. I'm sorry. I <laughs> 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 like math. <laughs> <laughs> so, the deal started in 1947. This is pretty astounding that this group has been around for over 75 years. And it was originally, uh, I think, all women who wove and came together and started an organization. And at that time, they treated it like a, an actual guild, which is a, a professional um, artisan group. And then you had to know how to weave before you joined and you had to be you know, accepted in. And over the years, uh, apparently more people in the group were also coming forth as spinners. And so eventually, with much duress from what we've heard, <laughs> they changed the name to Columbia Weavers and Spinners Guild. And then um, it's just continued to blossom. So at this time, we really 
would just embrace whatever fiber art form or technique uh, you bring forward. So knitting, crocheting, felting, uh, uh, bead making, basketry, paper making, there's some handmade paper back there, book making, uh, what am I forgetting? Embroidery. Embroidery, beading. It, we embrace all of that. And uh, I think it's, it's really, it's got a lot of popularity right now. There's a lot of stuff about weaving, weaving and crocheting on, on uh, you know, forums like YouTube and Pinterest and a lot more young people picking it up and trying it. And it's become more affordable because they keep inventing these little handmade, hand-sized, lap-sized looms that you can get started on without buying a $6,000 floor, floor loan, but you really will want one in the end. <laughs> to agree at some point. And small looms, looms are the gateway. Yeah, small loom. <laughs> yeah. Cherry's on a small oh, yeah. loom over here, gateway loom. Yeah. This is an Inco loom, a very old style of loom that lets you do band weaving. And band weaving, again, was come up, came, it was thought up in many parts of the world uh, with many different kinds of structures to create the band. But um, again, one that drive to figure out how to interlace fabric or fibers and um, woven fibers, or spun fibers and make them into some kind of other structure. So uh, we've been around a long time. We are a membership-based nonprofit. We meet monthly from September to June um, at the Bethel Baptist Church on Old Plank Road. We have a number of activities and uh, events. For instance, uh, we have the Youth Fiber, uh, Youth Fiber Arts Program where uh, we encourage teachers in the public schools to have their students try out one or more fiber art techniques and then we have a, a show and prizes at the end of the school year and this has grown and it's really fun to see what the, I was astounded by the stuff the students had done last year that uh, we had a show for so we have that we have scholarship funds for our members who want to go on and pursue some additional training in a particular area or go to a conference Sometimes we run workshops once or twice a year. We'll bring someone in who has a particular skill and run a workshop here. Uh, we have study groups, and I think this is a real gem of our organization. So, you know, all of us who do creative things with our hands, you end up working by yourself a lot. You're alone in a room, and, and that can be fine, but sometimes you want to interact with other people. So we have several study groups that are for particular areas. For instance, uh, I was talking about the complexity of some of those weaves. Well, there's one group that that's all they do is work with com more complex uh, looms and the weave structures you can get off those looms. Uh, we have knitting and crocheting. We have uh, fiber arts in general, which encompasses things like the paper making and the book making and all that. And, and they're so nice because it's a way that you can have a smaller group, you can educate each other, but you also have that social connection and support. And uh, so we have that. We have um, our own blending library. And a new thing that Pam started for us this year is called Fifth Saturdays. And uh, months that have a fifth Saturday, we try and have an event, mostly at the Boone County Electric Co-op Community Room. Uh, and it's sort of like this, members may bring their own work to just work on, but we also have demonstrations going on and maybe even a class from time to time, and the public is invited. So this is a nice way for people to come in and just kind of hang out and see, oh, how is that done? Or what if I wanted to pursue that more? Or, oh, I do that too, can I join? You know, and so Fifth Saturday is a big thing for us. And then our, our big event in the fall, our holiday exhibition and sale. And this is a, a, used to be in this building here. Um, and now we're over at the American Legion. And it's a combination of 
people there doing demonstrations so you can get up close, which you can here as well, to people who are doing something and see how it works, talk to them about the process. And then the sale itself is a, a giant room full of beautiful, beautiful handmade art. The amount of creativity in this group is really quite astounding. And our sale, we feel, is especially unique because it's a juried sale. It's not, you know, we want people to have all kinds of opportunities to sell their, their handmade items, but ours is specific because quality has always been the, the forefront of it. So when you come into our sale, you'll see all kinds, all kinds of different uh, items for sale from small, from jewelry, soap, felt colored soap, um, to, you know, rugs, garments, hats, clothing, decorations, things for your home. A big sale item is hand-woven hand -woven kitchen towels, or, well, they can be used for anything. Beautiful things, you know, if you only have one thing in your house that's handmade, they last forever. So, uh, we're very proud of our sale, and we hope you will all come and uh, see the things that we have at the sale. We have at the, on that back table where there's some fibers to uh, handle, bookmarks that you can take that have remember the date and tell you all about where it is and when it is. And um, if you want to be on our email list, and we only use it to send an email reminding people of this sale, we don't. We don't do other things with which is hard enough for us to get it organized into one thing. But we, we have some forms out there that you can fill out uh, as well. And if you are interested in membership or know someone who might be, we have some brochures back there. So sort of a quick overview of everything, but uh, again, I'm so happy to have you here. Sherry. And, and we have a Facebook. Oh, right. We have Facebook. We're getting our Instagram up and running. As and over the next few weeks, it'll get it'll get filled out some more. So we yes. have, and a QR code will be on something. Uh, talk about a little bit on this Saturday's Lisa comes with the. Oh right! So there's another. Well, you, you, some of you know Lisa Groshaw, who couldn't be here this morning because they're driving us out. And she said, "I suppose I could try and come in and." Because it comes to points out on sixty. <laughs> 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 and be there for you, but that's just. <laughs> um, but Lisa has been coming to this, and she and uh, uh, other people are working on developing a craft recycling cooperative. Well, not cooperative. Um, and so there's a big one in Kansas City, Scraps KC, which Lisa has worked at, and so she's they're using that as a model. Of course, it's not going to be that huge to get started, but the idea is that because we like materials and our stuff. We get a lot and then we have more than we need or whatever. And instead of those just, you know, being thrown away or you keep them forever, filling up your studio, yeah, with stuff that's like, so this that. needs to go out in the world. Uh, they will uh, collect it and eventually they've, they've gotten their 501c3 or they're getting it and hopefully can find a storefront at some point and start putting this stuff for sale and I don't know what their designated use for the funds is probably at the beginning it's just to keep it going but what a great thing and right now they're focusing on fabric yarn fiber stuff because it's easy for them to collect and store but I think eventually they'll branch out to all our supplies and they come they come to our fifth Saturdays and they bring some of the stuff they've collected and so we pass it around so we make a donation to them and collect something that somebody else had that we didn't think we needed, oh, but we really need. So <laughs> they give our stuff that we didn't think they need so somebody else can take it, you know. So it's really, it's yeah. really a great, you know, and it'll be way less expensive than in stores, commercial stores. So it's good, you know, way for students yeah. and anyone to um, pick up some stuff. So yeah, it, it leases there every month with that. And they're doing pop-ups and they're doing the Zipper Fest, uh, which I just yeah. heard about. Yeah. 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 Anyone can also tell us about it? Zipper Fest. Oh, John, what, so what, tell us about it. Um, so Zipper Fest started last year. No. <laughs> 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 it makes us feel so <laughs> <laughs> Come on, 
on, Daddy. You got it. It's <laughs> You're, You're in a safe space. You're in a safe space. Superfest is an arcade district. Um, the first time it happened was last year. And it's, Superfest is supposed to like just the community together. Oh, um, yeah, so, so it's good. always the first week in September. So it'll be the 7th. The 7th from 1 to 7 in the arcade district. Yeah. So it's well, well, another yeah. another opportunity for connections in the community around our specifically. Okay, I think I was going to say one more thing, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> um, if I could have, oh, Tina, we have a it's Saturday get together. Pam, do you want to talk about that? It is. So there are four there are four Fifth Saturdays every year, and so our next one is the thirty first of August. And it's actually going to be at the downtown Optimus because the Boone County was reserved. So, um, so it's, it's over by the library. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you go on it's our Facebook, grand. yeah, if you go on our Facebook page, you'll see it's from ten to two. And um, it's it's you just really nice. Yeah, you just visit and bring you your car. Bring yeah. your lunch, learn something. Yeah. And see what you can. Yeah. yeah, show us what you do, even if it's not five wheel. And it's free. And it's, it's free. Yeah, it's free. Yeah. 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 It's just fun to listen because you, you just hear the, you can feel the excitement in the room when everybody gets together too, and they're just all yeah. chatting yeah. and it's, it's great. a different environment it's when fun. you're when you're making in a group rather than yeah. isolated. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, you or any of your friends are welcome. And if I could just have my friends from the guild stand up and introduce themselves and tell us what many fiber arts you do. Okay. <laughs> Debbie's got the Debbie does. <laughs> I'm Debbie Wilson. Um, I just retired being president of the guild, and so I learned a lot from a lot of people there. I started out as a crocheter in high school, and I traveled to Australia and lived for a couple of years, and I got into spinning wool. It's not all places, Australia would be the place to do that. Yes. And um, so I have learned to knit. If I was going to make yarn, I needed to learn how to knit. So I added that, and then of course weaving follows that. And um, needle pelting is my newest thing, which I absolutely love to do. And spinning. And spinning. <laughs> <laughs> Which she's demonstrated. <laughs> Lovely little portable room that are real. Um, I'm Pam Haberlin, and um, my grandmother taught me to knit when I was 10. So, and you can tell by my hair, that's been a long time. <laughs> um, so, I, knitting was my first thing, but when I was five, I stepped on a bee, and my grandmother let me sew on her treadle sewing machine because. It hurt, and she didn't want me crying anymore. <laughs> and so, so I've been around fiber arts and sewing and stuff um, for my whole, for my mostly my whole life. Um, so I started out knitting, and then I quilted when I was in high school. Um, and then, um, as I got to be an adult, I, I took a basket weaving class at the store Weaver Store, which used to be above where Blue Stem is now. And then I took a weaving class. I bought a loom, um, and since I retired, my motto is, you only go around once. And if it's something you want to do, you need to do it. So I now have, I, I'm a, I'm owner of five looms, and they're four looms, <laughs> two equal looms. And, um, and I have, I started spinning last um, September, and I now have four weeks. Two electric and two regular. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've been taking some dyeing classes. So, um, so I, and I and I felt um, uh, I've taken Ruth Walker's um, wet felting class and um, not as good at needle felting, but I knit and then felt. And that, some of the stuff on that table back there is is my um, some of my my art. But um, um, and also just so the you know. I really mean it. When you want to do something, I always wanted to learn to tap dance. So last year, I started taking tap dance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I also trained, I, I always wanted to have my dogs trained, so I did dog training. And my tap dance teacher is also my dog trainer. <laughs> so in our recital, we do tap dancing with our dogs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha
set up all the programs for the guild meeting and um, yeah, hopefully everybody enjoys that. Um, I haven't been to a weaving store about, I don't know, about five or six years ago and um, was totally taken by what could be created on a loom. I always loved to make things, uh, you know, from a little kid. And um, so I bought my first uh, rigid heddle loom, and then that led to a bigger rigid heddle loom, which led to <laughs> my Inca loom, and I have a floor loom. I have two floor looms now, an eight shaft and a four shaft, and I uh, just got a tapestry loom, so it just keeps going from there. <laughs> um, but I love it. It's, it's so fun to, um, to see patterns develop, and, and you know, I, I, kinda, I guess I kind of grew up around, uh, my mom did tatting and knitting and crocheting, and I do dabble with crochet a little bit, and I've learned from Nancy things. So yeah, I'm just kind of dipping my toe into that. But yeah, I, I love fiber arts. It's great. Thank you. It's very rewarding. It is. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we've gone way over. Um, <laughs> while we were, while we were listening, I picked some of the one of the leaves and oh. 
um, stripped off a couple pieces and twined it. Oh my gosh. It so you can have it, or I'm sure you're going to make it, but think about how much of this you have to make to, to do what, what we do in our lives. So it's pretty cool. Um, thank you again for coming out on this Friday morning. And uh, I'm answer any questions, but I'm happy to see you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Feel free to check out all the all the items back there. Uh, I didn't know we could touch them, so that's good to know. Um, yeah. And that one, that one bowl is just raw wool, ready to be touched. There we go. Okay, good deal. Well, yeah, thank you all for coming out, um, and we will see you uh, next month back here at the Mont Mini. We'll be here uh, again next month, so hope to see you then. And what's your program next month? Uh, yeah. Emmett. <laughs> Emmett Russell from Russell Bills. Oh yeah, Russell yeah, Bills. Vision, no, wait, not vision. I'm sorry, reflection. Reflection. The theme. Yes, okay. yes. So yeah. He makes incredible. If you haven't heard of Russell Bills or seen some of their creations, they make incredible pieces of yeah. all sorts of different metals and the way they weld everything together. So Pretty cool. much anything cool around town that's made of metal, yep. Yep. particularly like signs and stuff. Like so that the new um, Columbia uh, sign right at. Um, Broadway and yeah, yeah. Broadway. they were involved in that, right? Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty sure that's their creation. And then they've done a bunch of, uh, I know, like the flyover sign, the flyover restaurant. That sign has been done by them. They do all sorts of stuff like that. And what's the theme? Uh, reflection. reflection. Yeah, reflection. Oh, that's so. pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> really good. Really good. So yeah, look forward to, to seeing y'all there. But thanks for coming out. Appreciate Woo. it. Thank you.